you started off just, just thinking of yourself as a design company with distribution was going to be through these stores. Didn't work out. That's right. You started off thinking that you were going to be a manufacturing um, organization. Yeah, helping small scale manufacturers. Having, uh, That's right. And, and that didn't work out. Right. Um, you discovered in the process that you needed to do marketing, so that began to give you some traction. Yeah. And then you decided to move your your uh, your manufacturing offshore into into China, where it could be standardized and still be produced at a at a low cost. So that began to work. That's right. Um, in terms of your your infrastructure, your your sort of that middle piece, um, how does the organization look today? So of course, once you move from basically a design firm, which is what we really started out, we thought we could design these great technologies, train a few local manufacturers and have them sit there. Once you move away from that and you move into a marketing and sales organization, it's a completely different structure required. All of a sudden, you need a chief marketing officer. You need uh, you know, dozens of, well, hundreds of salespeople. We have uh, about 180, 190 salespeople, commissioned sales staff in Africa. And they're the ones going out and doing these live demonstrations. And they're paid by commission. And they're paid on commission, a salary plus commission. Um, and they work with the retail shops. We have 450 retail shops. They're not our retail shops, but these are existing retail shops that now stock our pump and they're branded. Um, and so uh, we have these salespeople who are now attached to the retail shops and uh, you know, train them and uh, get out and do the demonstrations. Um, we have a, a marketing department in terms of you know, how do you do good advertisement, how do you do good radio advertising. Um, and then we still have our technology development unit where we continue to design new technologies. Um, and then we now work in China. So we now have to take those new technologies and work with these very large factories in China to do high quality mass production. So a lot of different skills, different kinds of manufacturing you can do in China than you can do in, in Kenya. Think about um, your distribution logistics, you have to think about your, your finance administration, your absolutely. IT systems and so on. Absolutely. And, and, and so you start to have to build a real company. Um, and this is also a sort of a transition from the sort of entrepreneurial startup where you have a couple of entrepreneurial guys who you know, say, hey, we can do it all and you're kind of doing everything and sort of fumbling along. Um, to now having a real company, and so all of a sudden you do need the system, so we're putting in place a, a complete um, MIS ERP system across the whole organization, so all of our um, information is computerized, everything from our accounts to our supply chain management to our donor management, um, all on the same system. Um, hiring private sector um, individuals who have worked in the private sector in terms of how to build a company, how to do marketing. So if you look at our CFO, our COO, our new country marketing directors, um, these are people who've worked in the private sector before. Um, and uh, of course, then you have to start professionalizing your fundraising because um, as you get bigger, you need a lot more money. Um, in our case, it costs us $350 to take one family out of poverty. Now that $350, that donor money, is everything from covering our fundraising costs, covering all our technology R&D costs, covering all of the marketing um, and uh, demonstration, um, training, training distribution, training. all this kind of thing, um, and also covers our impact monitoring. Because as long as we're using donor funds, we have to be very careful that we actually measure the impacts um, and prove that people really are getting out of poverty, because otherwise I can't come to a donor and say, you know, give us your money. I have to be able to say, this money is really working. So when you, um, when you say that you're bringing people out of poverty, these aren't just assertions. No, absolutely. We, we believe very, very strongly in impact monitoring um, and being able to prove that we actually have done what we say we're going to do. And so much of development nowadays and, and throughout the last 40 years um, really hasn't looked at these impacts. And so people say, here's a great idea, give me the money, let me go spend the money, and now give me some more money and I'll spend some more money. And they might tell a few stories, but nobody's actually going out there and measuring the impacts, at least very few people are. Um, and we were really one of the first people from when we first designed Kickstart way back in 1991, we said we have to be able to measure the impacts. Um, and now in the last uh, sort of three, four years, you see that uh, donors are starting to demand that impacts are being measured. But we've been doing it for the last uh, you know, 15, 20 years. Um, and so the way we do this is every pump, every piece of technology that's sold comes with a one-year guarantee. And so when the farmer goes into that little rural shop and they buy a new pump, they might be illiterate, but they fill out a guarantee form with the help of the shopkeeper, which tells us their location. Now, nobody has an address, but they have maybe the nearest primary school, the nearest church to where they live. Um, now, we get a database of all the buyers. They get a one-year guarantee, and of course, it's a marketing um, boom also. And with that database, we now randomly select people who bought the pump in the last one month. 
and we then go visit them. Now, it might take us a whole day to track them down in the rural area because they're living out there and we're looking for some woman, you know, Regina Mwangi, who bought a funny looking pump. And we know she's near this primary school in this church. And so somebody goes visits and, and we asks visit for them. where, exactly. do you know Regina who bought this funny looking pump? Exactly. And finally we find her and then we sit down with her and uh, we'll do a sort of three or four hour interview. And we have a whole team of staff who do this, and usually we will send a man and a woman together. So depending who you meet, when you come to the homestead, if you meet the husband, you, you can't be a woman talking to the husband. If you meet the wife, you need to be a woman talking to the, to the wife. Um, and we'll do a three or four hour interview and say, okay, how was your life this last year? How much money did you make? What crops did you grow? Um, were your kids in school? What kind of house did you live in? And then we'll come back to those same people 18 months later and look at their previous year now that they've had the pump and they've been using the pump for that previous year and compare that to what they were doing a year, 18 months ago. And this way we can really know the impacts. Now, not everybody who buys a pump gets out of poverty, but something like between, depending on the different models of the pump, between 80 and 85% of them do. Mm. Um, and, you know, some people don't use the pump, they've put it away for their retirement, they've decided to get into another business, they take other jobs, um, or they, or, sell, the pump or they sell the pump, or they, or they got given the pump by a relative, it wasn't really what they wanted anyway. Um, so it's not every pump that, that takes a family out of poverty, but a, but a large percentage of them do. And this way we can really track not only which families are getting out of poverty, but how much money they're making. Um, and if you look at the total revenues generated by the people using our pumps, for example, in Kenya, these total revenues are already equivalent to 0.6% of the GDP of Kenya. Um, so could you say that again? So the total revenues generated by the people using our pumps in Kenya, by these small-scale farmers, are equivalent to 0.6% of the GDP in Kenya. Now the GDP in Kenya, as in all developing countries, is a little bit of an informal number. It doesn't cover everything, but at least it's an order of magnitude. In Tanzania, we're up about 0.25% of the GDP um, from the total revenues of people using our pumps. So this is now macro impacts. In America, I think it's uh, Microsoft plus Cisco produce something like 0.5% of America's GDP. So you can see there's, these small pumps are actually having a real macro impact uh, in these countries. And it's only because of our impact monitoring that we can actually you know, know and, and track and know these figures. Your approach to impact monitoring is very interesting because it seems to combine both a um, quantitative and a qualitative aspect. Uh, so often one hears as a complaint from uh, nonprofits and, uh, and others that quantitative, Im quantitative impact monitoring leaves too much data on the table. It's not quantitative data, but it is data nonetheless. It mm -hmm. seems that the way you have gone about this with, with your interviews uh, collects the statistics that you can collect, but the information that, that is about people's real life, children going to school, um, the, their living condition, uh, being able to save a little bit of money, uh, being able to um, not have the, the cycles of starvation. Um, you can't necessarily quantify that, but, but that's data nonetheless. Yeah, and this is the thing about with impact monitoring, and you need to get some hard facts and, and data um, and the real quantitative stuff, but you also need the stories. Because to get the texture around it, you have to understand what does it mean to be able to send another kid to school? Right. Um, what does it mean that now this, this, this girl who otherwise was working at home and maybe going to collect the water, she doesn't have to collect the water anymore because now we have a well right on our site and people can you know, irrigate with it. They can also drink that water so they have more water in the household. So now she goes to school and they have money to afford to pay her to go to school. Um, so get those kind of stories. Um, we're actually at this point um, about to commission uh, IFPRI, which is the International Food Policy Research Institute out of uh, Washington, D.C., um, to do an independent impact monitoring program on Kickstart. Because we do very good internal impact monitoring, but you know, not everybody will believe all our numbers, and, and rightly so. I mean, they're, they're internally collected, they're very good, but uh, you know, I, I don't um, fault people for saying, well, you, know, you can't measure yourself. Right. Um, so we're now actually about to employ uh, IFPRI with some funding from Gates Foundation and uh, three IEs, another, another program who's funding it, um, to do a sort of three-year study. And now we're going to be looking at the impacts not only on income, but on uh, gender roles, on the environment, on education, on health of the family, and really get some hard data about uh, some of these other um, aspects. Um, what happens when people get richer? Yeah, you know, we all know that, or we expect that, you know, their diet gets better, therefore their health gets better. And we have a lot of antidotal stories that we can show that, but it'd be nice to get the numbers. I mean, for example, we've seen families 
where they have kids who are born before the pump was born, mm -hmm. and they had stunted growth because they didn't get enough to eat. And then kids who were born after they bought a pump mm -hmm. um, and started using a pump, who are now taller, even though they're younger, they're taller than the other kids because they don't have that stunted growth. Um, and so, you know, we can see the very, very clearly the impacts of making more money and having more food, and, um, but now we actually want to measure it uh, quantitatively. Well. I was going to ask you as well, uh, you started off with the example of, of uh, water stations that had fallen into disrepair. I was wondering whether, in an ironic way, you're finding that because of the uh, success of, of pumps in certain communities, that that then uh, causes people to take more ownership over things like water infrastructure and other, other infrastructure projects that are also important to their own success. So I mean, I think that's a, that's a secondary um, sort of impact that it's a little bit hard for us to observe yet. But absolutely, our strategy in Africa is to build an empowered middle class. Um, one of the things I always talk about is increasing the cost of the vote in Africa. In Africa... Increase the cost of the vote? Yeah, increase the cost of the vote. Okay. In Africa, effectively, we... we supported, as, as the America and the ex-Soviet Union, we supported some not particularly nice rulers in Africa. Um, they, were, they were dictators, and we supported them because they were on our side of the Cold War. Um, they were fairly smart, and so they also helped to look after their people. They provided free education, free health care, and su subsidized essential commodities. Um, and then we, we walked away from them, the end of the Cold War. We put in place structural adjustment. We reduced the amount of aid to Africa by a factor of 10, and turned around and said, OK, now put democracy in place. Um, and, uh, and so, of course, they, they tried to put democracy in place so they could still get donor funds. But, of course, a few people had all the money. And you can literally go out in the rural areas and buy a vote. And especially in the rural areas, the votes are very cheap. Um, and so for a few dollars, um, you, can, you can go and uh, you know, pay people and they'll, they'll vote for you. Um, and uh, so I always say, what we need to do is we need to increase the cost of a vote. Because when a vote's too cheap, um, democracy really doesn't work very well. Um, but if you can increase the cost of a vote, make it $10, $15, $20, um, then democracy starts to work a little bit better. You get slightly better government, you get slightly better policies, you get slightly more investment, the cost of the vote goes up to $20, $30, $40, um, and we can sort of reverse this downward spiral by building this empowered middle class who aren't going to sell their vote. And all of a um, sudden, it's cheaper for the politicians to actually do their job exactly. and provide services than to go out and directly try and, and buy votes. Exactly. So and, you and get votes by, by, by governing well, as opposed to absolutely. doing a very cheap uh, 50 cent transaction. Absolutely, because an empowered middle class is going to demand services. They're going to say, look, fix the road. You know, let's, let's fix the road. Let's fix the port. And um, let's put better tax policies in place. Um, and they're going to demand that, because they have something to lose. Um, and so, and this is what we need to do in Africa. We need to build an empowered middle class um, without having an entrepreneurial um, small and medium-sized businesses, um, we can't develop Africa. And it's just like the same in America, something like half the population comes from, I mean, sorry, half the, the jobs come from small and medium-sized uh, um, businesses. And the same thing has to happen there. And there's a lot of entrepreneurs out there who are willing to start these businesses. And like I say, all they need is an opportunity. You give them an opportunity, it's a first step up, they're going to create that middle class. Um, because otherwise, we're just going to be one more Band-Aid after another Band-Aid in Africa, and oh no, another drought, another famine, we gotta go give more hand out, give people more food. That's not a long-term solution. And in Africa, we've spent, in the last 40 years, close to a trillion dollars um, in aid, development aid. And for the average person, things really haven't got much better. Um, in fact, many countries have got poorer in, in that time. Um, so clearly, we're doing something wrong, and we need a new approach. And uh, that new approach, in my mind, has to be about empowering people to create businesses and have them power the economic development, create those jobs, um, and look after their self-interest. But uh, in, in so doing, create you know, a capitalist uh, system where they create jobs and they create businesses and, and they create an economy. What I also find to be fascinating is that you have this balance of contributed and earned income. The earned income basically comes from the developing world, your clients, mm -hmm. who are purchasing the, the products that you're selling. Um, that, of course, does not cover the entire cost of, of doing this successfully. So the contributed revenue is primarily coming from the developed world. So the combination um, is actually allowing you to provide the service. Um, how, does, how does that balance? Is it 50% 50%, 50 or is it? 
No, it's not that much. And it, it depends how one looks at one's total expenditure. If one looks at one's total expenditure as what's the total amount of money out the door, including buying the technologies, um, then we recover about 26%, 26 um, percent of, our, of our total from the sales, exactly. If we look at only the net margin mm -hmm. and compare that to our budget uh, that we spend um, without the COGS, cost of goods, then we only recover about 5 or 6%. Okay. Um, and the reason for this, the reason it's so expensive is precisely because of this market failure where it's very, very expensive to convince these very poor, hard-to-reach people to buy a new technology. And this is precisely the reason, because of this market failure, it's precisely the reason that today a farmer in Africa is still only using two tools, a machete and a handheld hoe, because nobody has figured out how to sell them that third tool. Because for a private company to go in and do it, the cost of distributing and convincing people to buy a third tool is simply too expensive. Now, eventually what will happen is after we do all this marketing, our pumps will become as commonly known as a bicycle in Africa. Everybody in Africa knows what a bicycle is. They know where you can get one. They know how to repair it. The bicycles were introduced in the colonial days. So they've been around for, you know, 100 years or more. Um, once the pumps are as commonly known as a bicycle, it'll become purely profitable to sell them. You won't have to go out and do all these demonstrations anymore right. and convince people what they are. Um, and then we can leave in place a completely profitable supply chain that continues to provide these pumps. And at that point, of course, competition will come in. Other people will say, hey, there's, uh, we, just like we can sell bicycles in Africa, now we can sell irrigation pumps in Africa. And other companies will come in and start to sell pumps as well. And that'll be great. Because what we're trying to do is give the poor um, choices, opportunities to start businesses and make sure that on the market, on the local market, they have the tools and equipment they need to get out of poverty. And so once we've reached that tipping point where everybody knows about these uh, pumps, um, then we can walk away from it and or we can continue to, we'll continue to sell, but we'll lose market share. But, um, and then we'll go on to the next technology or the next country. Um, so what we want to do really is be very, very efficient at using donor funds to get to that tipping point with a new technology. Right. Um, and uh, that's why we have to measure our impact, because we're using donor funds. And so I'm saying, when I'm coming to a donor, I'm saying, you know, we want money to do this. I have to be able to say, for every $350, we can show you that we take a family out of poverty. Now, our target is $300, and we're going to get there. We're a little bit higher right now, because we're doing some capacity building. Right. I, I describe we're building, uh, you know, putting these new systems in place and a bunch of other capacity building. Um, but eventually, it'll $300 to take a family out of poverty. And what's more is after 10 or 15 years, once you reach uh, the tipping point in a particular country, those families are going to get out of poverty for free because those pumps are just going to go on selling themselves. And then we go into another country, another technology. And you, so you subcontract your manufacturing, and then you have a, an operating unit in Kenya. How many people are in Kenya um, that are associated with So overall staff? in Africa, we have 250 staff. And, and how that's many? in Kenya, in Tanzania, in Mali, and a few in Burkina Faso. Um, so in Kenya, it's about 180 of those are in Kenya, and that includes our headquarters where we have our technology development unit. So we have about uh, 20 people doing technology development, um, three engineers and some technicians. Um, then we have a team doing impact monitoring, mm -hmm. and so in each country we have about six or seven people doing impact monitoring. Um, and then we have our marketing and sales teams. And how many people do you have uh, in the United States and in other Western countries? So back in the States, I came back to the States in uh, 2001 because we realized we wanted to diversify our fundraising base. And so I came back here to really start raising money from private individuals and, and foundations. Before that, all of our money had come from USAID, the, the American government, the Dutch government, and the British government. But that money was very, very restricting um, in that they like to tell us how to spend it and what to do. And so I came back here and said, let's diversify our fundraising. And it started off with uh, just myself, and then I had a small team um, and right now we have five people. So it's myself and uh, two top guys doing development, um, and then we have an office manager and uh, a development assistant. So you have five people in the United States and 250 people in Africa. That's right, yeah. So just five people here in San Francisco. And of course in Africa, the vast, vast majority uh, of our staff there are Africans. Um, I think we have a total of six expats in, in Africa. And uh, what does the future for Kickstart look? Like, is it going to be continuing to build out uh, on this this product line, which now focuses on the water pumps, um, or are you uh, expecting to take the idea of of doing that analysis, um, developing uh, product, and and continuing to develop more product? What does the next uh, three to five years, let's say, look like? 
So the potential for these irrigation pumps in Africa is something between 15 and 20 million families who could use these pumps. And how many now? Right now we've got almost 90,000 families using them. We're just scratching the surface. Um, and so because the vast majority of poor are poor rural farmers and we have to tackle rural poverty, we're going to concentrate on irrigation technologies. Now, that doesn't mean we're only going to have the two pumps we have now. We're already designing and going to be introducing new pumps, deep lift pumps that can pull from deeper depths. Uh, we're working on methods of drilling uh, very, very low-cost boreholes and shallow wells. Um, so a lot of other irrigation technologies will come in ways of capturing water and storing water and drip irrigation and these other kinds of uh, uh, approaches. Um, but really concentrating on irrigation in Africa. And right now, like I said, we're in Kenya, Tanzania, and Mali, and Burkina Faso. We're only in four countries. There's at least 20 countries in Africa which could have huge benefits from what we're doing. Um, so we want to move into those other countries. Um, so really in the next uh, five years, heavily concentrate on just scaling up. Taking a proven model and scaling it up, moving it into new countries, um, you know, we want to be selling, right now I told you we're selling 30,000 pumps a year, we want to be selling, you know, 200,000 pumps a year. And I think we can get there. Um, and it's just a matter of building those markets, building the market demand, getting to the tipping point in Kenya, and then moving on, getting to the tipping point in Tanzania, where these things start to sell themselves, and then can moving you, into new countries. Can you get there with the financial model that you have now, or does that also have to evolve in, in such a way that there are other players who are, who are investing in, in, um, in the expansion of this, uh, of this model, of this, of this business. So, so we're expanding in two really different models. So one model is that we're simply replicating what we do, which is establishing on the ground um, a for-profit supply chain and doing all this mass marketing. The other model we have is we sell these pumps to other nonprofits working in many different countries. And so we actually have our pumps in over 20 countries in Africa. Uh, if you go, go, for example, to Malawi, where we don't work, we have over 20,000 of our pumps in Malawi. And this is other NGOs there now that are working with farmers and offering our pumps out to farmers on credit. Um, and then we're setting up some retail shops there. But it's not the intensive on the ground marketing that we're doing in Kenya and Tanzania. Now eventually we're gonna have to do that because if you don't have a retail network, if you don't have a supply chain, these things aren't sustainable. But what they're doing is seeding the market for us. Um, so absolutely working hand in hand with these other organizations and virtually every large organization, whether we're talking about FAO or UNICEF or Save the Children or Mercy Corps, all these people have bought our pumps and, and are using them in their programs yeah. around Africa. Um, so that's a, a key part of our strategy is to work with those large, other large organizations. Um, and then on the ground, we, we set up the supply chain in the countries where we work. Um, in terms of fundraising, we primarily get our money now from the private foundations and private individuals. Um, eventually, we'd like to be able to get more money out of governments, but this really requires that uh, the government funders change the way that they think about funding. Um, they're very, very inefficient in the way they fund right now. They like to dictate what you do with the money. They like to put together large RFPs, uh, requests for proposals that you bid on with multiple partners, and um, very, very inefficient. Um, rather and, bureaucratic, rather, rather uh, costly just to participate with them. Absolutely. It, it's bureaucratic, it's costly. We, we did a program like that working in uh, Mali. When we first went into Mali, we had some USAID money, and we were there in a consortium with five other organizations. It was literally like working with our hands tied behind our back. Um, because we just, it was so bureaucratic, it was so slow, we couldn't do what we know we needed to do. Um, and then USAID cut off the money after a year and a half, which very often happens too, they took all the money to Iraq, and everybody else of course went home, and we said, well, we're on the ground in Mali, let's raise some private funds, let's stay in Mali, and now we have a very dynamic program in Mali. Um, and anyway, so really concentrating on private sector money, um, we uh, have some very big supporters. Gates Foundation is a great supporter. Um, John Deere Foundation yes. um, is a fantastic supporter of ours. We have a very nice partnership with them. Uh, people like uh, Jeff Skoll, Lemelson Foundation. Um, so these are some of the larger foundations. Um, and then we have a lot of supporters who sort of give us anywhere from, uh, um, you know, $5,000 a year up to a couple hundred thousand dollars a year as private individuals and private family foundations. And we really need to expand on that base. Um, and then at the same time, we want to expand down to the sort of more annual um, givers who can give us anywhere from, you know, $5 a, a year um, up to a few thousand dollars a year. Um, now, of course, that kind of fundraising takes a lot more effort um, and uh, requires more expenditure on the actual fundraising itself, but eventually we want to get there. Um, you know, our, our ambition is to be working in these, you know, almost 20 countries in Africa um, to, you know, 
take a big chunk out of these 15 to 20 million pumps that could be used. And continue to area. focus on rural poverty. Absolutely. So you're not going to be in the urban areas where a lot of people are concentrated already. You're going to a place that is difficult to serve. That's right. Uh, but you're also going to a place, as you say, 80% of the, of the poor are the rural poor, the rural poor. in yeah. Africa. Yeah. It is, it is an amazing, amazing concept that you brought in from uh, PhD studies in mechanical engineering at Stanford all the way to, to Kenya, to Mali, to 20 countries in Africa. I think, it's, uh, I think it's phenomenal what you've done, and thank you so much for joining us today, and thank you for your work. Well, thanks a lot. It's a pleasure to be here. Martin. Thank you. Great. Thanks.